Um, I'm going to tell you just a couple of, of things. How many of you are urban studies students and how many of you are political science students? So urban studies first, sorry about that. And then political science. Um, Fernando and I have had this, or Professor Guerra and I have had this conversation a couple of times, but one of the things I always try to impart to people, uh, particularly when you're studying something, is don't get too overwrought in the academics of it all. Uh, we're here to talk about transportation, and one of the, my complaints, and I'm only going to spend a couple months on this, one of my complaints about transportation planning and the reason why it doesn't make a lot of sense is that it has been overrun by engineers and planners. And for particularly those of you that are studying urban planning, one of the things that you have to do, in fact, the example of this exit poll is a perfect example, is that we make the overwhelming majority of our transportation decisions based upon some model that somebody did on a computer. And what we don't do, and what I have been urging people to do more of, what we don't do is talk to enough real people. Uh, we have people who want to do HOV lanes or toll roads or... Uh, we talk about public transit and mass transit, and these are all great concepts. But they don't work unless people, people like you, will actually ride them. Perfect example is HOV lanes. Uh, how many people actually use the HOV lanes? Diamond lanes. Diamond lanes, yeah. Sorry. Carpool lanes. Sorry, this is another thing is we have these acronyms that nobody knows what they are. Tell them what Tell me. And, so, and so let me ask you another question. How many people actually changed their behavior, meaning they actually arranged with someone to do a carpool for the purpose of using the carpool lane? So a, a significantly smaller number of you. So carpool lanes were, were, were brought into because we said we need to reduce traffic. And so if we allow people to go a little bit faster in the carpool lane, um, they will carpool. There actually is no evidence, and no one's ever really done a study, that people actually, on a regular basis, change their behavior for the sole purpose. If you're already going somewhere and you were going to go with a friend, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, I was going to go from point A to point B, and I called around and got somebody to go with me for the purpose of going faster through the carpool lane. And so there's no, so we spent like billions of dollars on these carpool lanes, which there's no evidence that they actually work. And so the, 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 the one important lesson which I think goes for along transportation and in politics. We, in, in politics, we sit and we look at polls uh, uh, where, the, we, where we do a sample of people and we think of all of these high-tech things to do. Uh, and Bill Fitzgerald can tell you uh, that Mr. and Mrs. Jones or Mr. and Mrs. Espinoza or Mr. and Mrs. Lowenthal uh, often have no clue about any of this stuff that we talk about and don't care. Um, because we're interested in stuff. And I'll tell you one little example from my first campaign for the assembly in 1994. Um, I was a relatively young guy, although not as young as you guys. Uh, uh, and I, you know, had my issues down. You know, you talked about issues, and I knew what my issues on this were, and I knew the things that I wanted to emphasize, and I had, you know, six-point plans for a whole bunch of different things. And my father, is, as Fernando mentioned, is uh, also in politics. And so I, I viewed him as the old guard. And I was the new kid, and I was going to do things differently. And I got all these computer programs and, did the, and, and created these mail pieces myself. And it was all high tech and forward thinking. And my father said to me, uh, let me do a couple of mail pieces for you. Let me help you, help you on your campaign. And I said, no, this is the new way. And he said, shut the hell up and let me do this one piece. <laughs> and so, even, you know, <laughs> he did the one piece. And I'll tell you what this piece was. And, for, and this is 94, so uh, the woman's right to choose was an issue, and uh, uh, budgeting was an issue, racial profiling had become an issue, firearms were an issue. There were all of these broad issues that I'm sure you guys have talked about. And so, this piece of mail was a black and white picture on one side. It had a picture of myself, my father, and my sister. My mother had passed a few years before, and it was before I was married. So it was our family picture. And then on the other side was a letter from my sister, which said, uh, my mother would have been writing to you, uh, except she recently passed. My brother is a very talented person, 
please vote for him. I mean, it was, it was a little bit more eloquent than that, but that's what it said. Not, nothing, it said nothing about an issue. Uh, and it was the most overwhelmingly well-received piece in the entire campaign. Uh, and so what, you, what we all have to understand is that all of this inside the baseball park, uh, to use uh, uh, that term, or all of this stuff we talk about that's very intellectual, people who are working two jobs a day to get their kids through school and, 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 and make a better life for themselves, they don't have time for all of that discussion. So which is not to ignore the issues, but make sure that you make things plain enough um, that people can understand and that you have to talk, whether it's transportation or whether it's politics in general, um, to real people on a real basis. And you know, you guys will graduate from here with a, you know, a, a lot of you know, with degrees, and many of you will go on to graduate schools, and you'll be maybe a PhD uh, uh, like Professor Guerrero, and you'll know all of these exotic things, and you'll do polls, and you'll analyze the polls, and you'll look at demographics, and you'll analyze the demographics. The question is, uh, what drives Mr. and Mrs. Jones to vote? And what drives them to vote more often than not is just whether or not they have a personal, they feel that they have a personal connection to you. And I was able to win in my district chiefly because I had grown up there, uh, but a lot of people had no idea really who I was or what my positions were. But they voted for me because they knew my sister, went to school with my sister, knew my mom, uh, 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 knew of my sister, uh, you know, all sorts of things like that. So it is a personal connection or at least the feeling of a personal connection um, much more than any specific issues. Uh, and so if, that, if there's one sort of thing that I can impart to you, it's to not as much as you learn all of the technical stuff you learn, which I think is very important, uh, because one of the things that happened when I was running for office in 94 was I could not find any of my peers who could help me with it. Uh, and there, uh, so, so, so the idea that there are young people who know the technical part of running campaigns and of being involved in politics I think is very significant. But don't let that overshadow the fact that the average voter doesn't really care about all of those exotic things until it's one thing that affects them directly. You know, a labor union member is going to be interested in pension reform, and people that are involved in various issues are interested in their things. So um, uh, remember that you know it's the it's the what what I used to call my dad was hokey. My dad also I don't if if any of you live, and I guess South Central Los Angeles is pretty much the territory. My dad puts out. Um, what we call a slate. Have you guys talked about that? No, we haven't spoken about that. Uh, well, he puts out a, 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 a kind of a tabloid slate called uh, the California Democrat, which he's been putting out for 30 some odd years, since the, more than that now, six since the 60s, so almost 40 years. Um, and he puts in it these old pictures. And people, candidates, like myself included, complain about the pictures, you know, the pictures are like from the 60s. So, you know, we all had different hairdos and, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, if, you, if you've ever looked at some of your parents, maybe old pictures, or you guys are in college now, I bet, I bet a lot of you are not really that proud of your prom picture anymore. Um, so, so imagine that you're running for office, you know, imagine that you're running for office now and you think you're smart and you've got it going on and, your junior prom picture is the thing that is put in the advertisement. So he puts in these old pictures, and people complain and, 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 and say, don't want you to put an updated picture of me, and it's my new hairstyle and my new outfit and my new uh, color consultant and style consultant. But again, the reason he persists in doing this is what he's developed over a certain amount of time is a comfort level with voters in the area that he sends this. And so they expect to get this thing every year. And you know what? That's how they view the people in it. Uh, you know, Maxine Waters particularly used to complain about this old picture of her from like the late 60s, early 70s. But many voters, and I, I assume you guys have talked about the fact that the majority of voters are seniors that are older. The plurality of voters. The plurality of, of, of voters are older. And so, uh, you know, an old lady, an old man who's in her 60s, that's how she remembers Maxine Waters. She doesn't remember the you know, cool, hip Maxine Waters with the new hairstyles. She remembers the lady from the 60s. And that's what you want. You want to connect with people, and you, but you want to connect with them on their level. So when you do stuff that you think impresses you, you have to ask the question, um, does that really impress 
your audience, um, who's the voter. And in the transportation case, um, you have to ask the question, will this highfalutin, you know, really smart idea I have based upon some algorithm, uh, uh, that, that some statistical algorithm that somebody created, will that really translate into people changing their behavior? And so there are things like congestion pricing and mass transit and all those things that we say, well, gee, we'll, we'll spend billions building this thing and it'll relieve, relieve congestion. But if nobody will get on it, uh, because it doesn't allow them the flexibility um, to go pick up their kids if they have to or to go run errands at lunchtime, then we've spent a billion dollars on uh, wasting our time. So with that, I'll just okay. turn it over Why to you. Why don't you have a seat and we'll okay. have, uh, I got about three or four questions for you and then we'll open it up to the students to ask some questions. Okay. okay. You'll be first. Chomping at the bit there, are you? Okay. Um, you know, you're one of the few people that I know that actually gave up a, what I, some would consider a little more, more prestigious position and making a lot more money to go into public service. Um, why did you do that? Um, in my particular case, uh, I was having a lot of fun. Uh, I wish I had, was making more money than I was at the time. And probably had I, had I been making a really just a lot of money, I probably would not have, give, to be, if I was to be honest. But uh, I come from a political family. And, uh, or people that have been involved in public service in one way or the other, another. My dad was a, uh, he was an elected office, but for less of his, for more of his career than the time he was in elected office, he was a uh, field representative or a policy person or a campaign manager. He got very involved in reapportionment a couple of times. Um, so it was a world that was accessible to me. And this is the other thing that I, that I want to impart to you. Uh, I was in the entertainment business. In the entertainment business and politics, two very clicky kinds of things. You, you see a lot of the same people over and over. And what the advantage that I had was I had seen it up close and so it wasn't a mystery to me. So there was never any question in my mind that I could get involved in it. And I think one of the things that you should do is like the announcements that uh, uh, Professor Guerrero made. Um, you ought to go and work in somebody's office or intern somewhere and one of the things it'll do is it'll take the sheen and take the mystery off of it. Um, and you'll see how the sausage is made and presumably you'll still be interested in it, but it will definitely take a layer of veneer um, off of it because the people in this business, much like people in Hollywood, in, in the final analysis, you know, they go home and have to do the same things that we all have to do. Um, so that was one of the reasons. And the other reason is that t because of term limits, which I don't support, but which gave me this opportunity, um, the person in my neighborhood where I grew up um, decided that, to run for Secretary of State and so the seat became open. Um, and having been involved in politics, it's kind of a funny little story. I was sitting with a friend of mine who was also involved in politics, and he's also from my neighborhood, and we were sort of lamenting the fact that the only candidates who we had heard about that were running for this seat were people who weren't from our neighborhood, who were people from outside or people from some uh, elected official's office. And he said, well, you know, y you know a little bit about this and you know how to, my, my, my competitive advantage when I ran was that I'd been around enough that I knew how to run the campaign. So I knew how to do it kind of cheaper and faster um, than many people. And if, when you ask questions, I can go into why that is. Uh, and he said, well, why don't you run? And I said, I don't really want to run, uh, but I don't like the fact that somebody from outside is running, but I don't really want to do this. And he said, well, that's right, you probably couldn't win. And then I said, what do you mean I couldn't win? And there you go. <laughs> that, I said, what do you mean I couldn't win? So then I said, well, if I did these six things, I'd have a better chance than eight of these other nine people. And then I said, if I pulled off these other two things, then I could win. So like the next day, I sort of laid it out and I said, well, gee, I think I could win. Uh, and, I was, uh, and I took my shot and unfortunately for me, I did win. It was nine people running. Uh, I run with, and this is, you talk about pluralities, I won with 21% of the vote, but the next person had 16% of the vote. Uh, and then the next election, I think I won with 70 or 80% of the vote, so. so. Talk to us a little bit about racial profiling. I mean, you're black, right? Uh, <laughs> I only ask that because you keep calling him or your dad over there, that white guy over there. <laughs> well, he's, Godfather. you know. Godfather. I gladly he, he, he's got an honorary black man's car. We, we, we issued him one long ago. He, he literally, for 20 years, was the only, black, only white family in our neighborhood. So, and he, he stayed throughout, so we, we like that. Well, one day someone told him he was white and he moved out. Well, yeah, he that's didn't true. know that. <laughs> so, um, and he's got 11 kids, so that we knew he was either black or brown. Yeah. <laughs> or Irish. <laughs> 
Racial profiling. You passed some legislation about it. Talk, talk to us well, about I did. personal experience. I mean, clearly, uh, is there anybody in this room that like, even remotely believes that there's a question as to whether racial profiling happens on a regular basis? You, can, you, you white people can say yes if you really believe that. It. It's okay. Um, here's, the, here, here's the most insidious thing about racial profiling. Is, um, uh, when it comes to racial discrimination, um, many people would like to make it about class and not about race. Um, they would like to say, well, if you're a black lawyer or a black doctor, then you're not really discriminated against because you've got more going for you than a white plumber or a white you know, blue collar worker. And while that may be true, you have to ask the question, why does the black lawyer get compared to the white blue collar worker as opposed to as against the white lawyer? And so in my case, um, I was, I, and, and what infuriated me most about it is that I have done all of the things that society has said you should do to sort of gain some respect and get successful. Went to college, graduated from college, came to here to Loyola, got an MBA, went to Loyola Law School, got elected to the legislature. Um, my you know, family, my father had been elected to the legislature and my parents had both uh, uh, attended college. So uh, as a family, we had done all of these things that you theoretically are supposed to have a leg up on. And then the other thing they say is, well, it's how you look. It's how you dress. It's you wear the baggy pants. And it used to be Raiders caps. I don't know what the, the thing is. Or driving a low rider or having primer spots on your car, you know, all of those kinds of, all of, those kinds of things. So this happened to me on primary election night. I had just won. I had been elected to the state senate after having served four years in the assembly. And I, of course, was wearing my best suit at the time, um, driving a Corvette, a relatively new Corvette. Um, and I got pulled over in Beverly Hills by the police. Well, what were you doing in Beverly Hills? That's not in your district. <laughs> <laughs> that was the question I think they were asking. Um, Mind you that I worked seven years at the William Morris Agency right in the heart of Beverly Hills and walked to lunch every day and spent a lot of time, frankly, in that, in that area. Um, oh, so they just wanted to say hello. Yeah, exactly. So then they pulled me over. They asked, you know, I gave them my driver's license. Um, and then they didn't charge. They didn't write me a ticket. They did, I hadn't done anything, so they couldn't write me a ticket. And... Um, so I sort of complained about that and ended up you know, filing suit and, and it got tagged into a lot of other suits and I think the suits were eventually settled. But we passed the bill and there was a great um, response from the law enforcement community who said, how dare you accuse us of doing this? And you know, I don't know, in, in my neighborhood, I actually, in my neighborhood, actually had a relatively good relationship um, with the, the couple of local police that, that we saw all, all the time. But, you know, where most people come from, if you are black or brown, this is a thing that happens to you, and it happens to you, and the most insidious thing is that it happens to you no matter what socioeconomic strata you are, because uh, a couple of weeks after that, there was a guy who was the president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association um, driving home with his kids, you know, in his Mercedes, um, gets pulled over and, like, taken out of the car and searched. Uh, and, it, you know, there was a time I remember I used to drive down Wilshire Boulevard um, and uh, you would always see some black or brown kids not just pulled over, but out of the car sitting on the curb. See, that's kind of the other difference is that it's one thing to pull you over and ask you questions. It's another thing to take you out of the car. And we did studies and every study. I mean, so they, they said, oh, you're, you're, you're exaggerating. You're just you don't believe in studies. You were just telling us. Well, I said you have to talk to people. Oh, OK, I don't believe in computer studies. Uh, and we did studies, and they did one in Maryland on, uh, uh, on the East Coast about people going up and down I-95 where like 70% of the people uh, were, that were stopped were uh, people of color, and, uh, and they were 20% of the actual population. Uh, and so we did all of these, we, we did all these studies. Um, and in, in the final analysis, uh, the bill that we came up with required some additional training because the police officers in, 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 and the other thing that we found out also is that racial profiling is perpetrated by minority officers just as much as white officers, if not more. If not more. I, think, I, I think many of you are right. And um, What explains that? That 
one of the things that they do in police training, much like going to the Marines, in the beginning of it, they sort of break you down and then sort of create you in their image. So you, you really do begin to think and talk uh, uh, like blue rather than whatever cultural background you were, and that includes any of the other cultural backgrounds. Um, so uh, ha if you ever have a conversation with policemen, they talk police speak even when they're not you know, doing police business. You know, you, you, you'll hear policemen off duty say, you know, I'm going to get in my vehicle. Uh, you know, not that many people say, you know, talk, say, they'll say, I'm going to get in my car or whatever slang they use, but they wouldn't say vehicle. And they, would, they, they, have, this very, they have this very weird police speak. And so that, that, is, that is the reason. Um, and racial profiling still goes on today. It's not quite as much in the press. Uh, the ACLU had a huge effort to do it, uh, to, to deal with it. Um, and they were actually, this is another example of sort of public policy making. The ACLU was in the business to sue people. Uh, when we were doing a piece of legislation. Well, I see they're in the business to protect rights. Well, but they do that, they do that by suing people. Okay. Um, and they also have a legislative division. But here's what happens. You go to, you're, you're doing a, a piece of legislation on racial profiling. And you go to deal with the law enforcement agencies because you know, they've got friends in the legislature or people who support them just like people on your side do. So you find that there are people who have different perspectives. So you go to talk to them about it and they say, well, our biggest fear is not that you, is that you don't really want to stop racial profiling, but that you just want to create an environment where someone can sue us and we can either have to pay a lot of money or be, um, or, 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 or be subject to embarrassment from these lawsuits. Um, and so then you say no. We really, I, I think I was chair of the Black Caucus at the time, we're really interested in the public policy and we want to fix these things. We don't want our people profiled and we don't want our, we profiled and we don't want our people um, to be subject to more intense searches. Because the other thing that happens is that not only do they stop you more often, but after they stop you, they're more likely to search you, more likely to take you out of the car, more likely to do all of the other things. Um, and we said, no, 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 we're really interested in the policy. And then of course, a week later, the ACLU sued them sort of without telling anybody. So that got everybody's back up and sort of actually kept the policy back um, a couple of years. But the, the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice George, who's actually a very wonderful guy, a Republican appointee, um, did a study about racial attitudes in the court system. And the study found um, in talking to people at every level that at every level people of color were viewed differently. The, the, if, if you, the black lawyers were treated differently by people like the bailiff. Um, they were treated differently by the secretaries and the service people. And you could, there was a, and, and, and you know, this was not a study done by some, you know, left wing uh, a minority advocacy. This was the Republican Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court is one of the slowest institutions to actually make change, but to his credit, he was very public about the study and the results of it and has instituted some changes, not as many of I, as I'd like, but some changes to move forward. So following the, you know, obviously you talked about the, uh, the uh, legislative black caucus in your, not that you only do uh, black legislation or ethnic legislation, but the majority of your district is not black. As a matter the of fact, majority it's of only like 30% African American. Uh, right? yeah, it's not black. I, I have the largest Jewish population of any Senate district in the state. Uh, and so as a result, I do legislation on lots of things. My, the current bill that I have now is one that uh, adds, increases the use of solar power. Uh, I've done most of the internet legislation uh, on spam and on spyware. I'm doing a bill now on phishing and a bill now, a bill now on peer-to-peer -peer networking. I do most of the entertainment business related stuff. We'll let her catch her breath. Don't be paranoid the, yet. Yeah. Um, the, chair, the chair of transportation in the assembly got lost on the way over here. So, Thanks. Um, uh, but, um, <laughs> one of the solutions, I mean, the other thing that we've got to stop doing is we've got to stop thinking that there's some great idea and some great magic bullet that we'll do to fix this. The fact is, our population has grown exponentially and we have not spent as much on transportation um, as we should. Right. Um, and w years ago we did that. We have all sorts of budget pressures, including golf going all the way back to Proposition 13. But the other thing that has to understand is you can't look at transportation in a vacuum. 
because the pressure, the other pressures on the budget caused us to pull money that would otherwise go for transportation. So there are a lot of people who say, you know, let's spend more money on transportation and let's do a tax on transportation. But if you can't pay for education and you can't pay for health care, you're always going to steal a little money from what was otherwise allocated to transportation and go there. Boy, so. has he changed his tune since last year when he was chair of transportation committee. I never would have heard those words out of your mouth Yes, I, you, I have not changed at all. Now he's the caucus chair. Well, and by the way, by, by the way, this, she represents a part of Long Beach with the 710, so you can ask that question oh. for her. <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I'm gonna do right now is maybe get three of you to ask a question, and in the um, attempt to answer some of those questions, maybe you can do some introductory remarks as well, and have you answer some of those questions as well, just because uh, we're running a Cause little I, bit, because you were late. late. Yeah. Uh, um, so let me get a question here first, and we wanna use the, the let's go over here first, okay? And we want to use the mic only so that the, uh, we can record it. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts like on transportation in terms of like in terms of the infrastructure and like future planning. Like what can be done to ensure that in communities where um, like racial minorities, people that are soci not socioeconomically disadvantaged and communities like where there's immigrants, where um, they won't be like negatively affected by the decisions. Like for example, I live in East LA and the five, the 10, the 60, the 101, the 710, they all run through there. And the, I mean, we know the communities where the freeways don't run through at all. So I was just wondering, like, in terms of future planning, what can be done to, like, address that well, kind of issue? Let, let me get one more, couple more questions. That way we can address, incorporate all of them. Sherry, go ahead. Hi, my name is Sherry. Um, a few of us actually, about 20 of us, were up in Sacramento this weekend, and we saw the railways you guys have. Light rail. The light rail. Light rail. And we actually thought it was a brilliant idea to have that in Los Angeles and, you know, why that hasn't happened. Here's a perfect example. We, we do have it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in a number of different, you want to, you can check that one. Let me get one more question, David, and then you can, in, in, in doing that. Uh, regarding the carpool lanes, uh, I was driving uh, up in, uh, I think I was driving in Oakland, um, a while back on the freeway heading down here. and. Um, I noticed they're a lot smarter with their carpool lanes over there. It's not a double yellow line separating it. It's actually a broken white line, and it's only a carpool lane during rush hour traffic hours. And the rest of the day, it's a normal lane of the freeway, and we get to utilize that lane of the freeway, and it just makes the freeway wider, and it's the best idea ever. I don't know why we don't have that. Well, the, the What's rush hour in LA, well, they're, they're <laughs> to the Part of the problem is, what, just what you said, they're, they're, our transportation is so congested that you know, it's Rush crowded on Saturday day. too. Uh, and the second thing is, is that the carpool lanes, in my view, don't even work during rush hour. I disagree. She well, disagrees I with that concept, but. Why don't we let uh, assembly member Jenny Oropesa answer, or try to answer three of these questions together. Assembly member uh, Oropesa represents Long Beach. Uh, she's uh, been elected uh, three times now to the assembly. She's serving her fifth year. Um, she, before that, was a council member in the city of Long Beach, the first Latina to serve uh, on that city council. And before that, she was on the school board in Long Beach, the first Latina to ever serve in that capacity. Uh, she was also uh, president of her uh, university, Cal State University Long Beach, I think, right? I think uh, two times. Um, she tried to get into Loyola Marymount, but well, that's another story. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, it was too far for her to drive at that time, and they didn't have directions. So, um, <laughs> so I, I give you uh, Assembly Member uh, Jenny Oropesa. She would have been the first Latina at Loyola. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, in addition to Long Beach, I also represent Carson, Wilmington, Harbor City, Harbor Gateway, and and uh, part of the city of Lakewood. And those so are very important distinctions for the for they the future. They certainly are. They certainly are. Um, Okay, the first issue that was raised is really all uh, sort of um, you can encapsulize in the concept of environmental justice of which we have little today uh, relative to transportation infrastructure where there's a lot of pollution. Also the placement of dirty industry, you know, same problem with the placement of dirty industry is in, you know, low income communities. As legislators, I think we are very concerned about that. A lot of us are. I know the Latino Caucus is very concerned about that, of which I'm an active member. And um, what we try to do is chip away 
through policy, uh, like how to clean up um, uh, dirty facilities, how to look at equitable funding for improvements on the overcrowded highways in the um, communities of color, because of course the, con the, the pollution comes from congestion, comes from idling as well as driving uh, and the traffic. So uh, if we can improve and, and, and increase the capacity, which is very difficult uh, where you're talking about in East LA because um, everything is so dense and we got homes right up against the freeway. Um, but we have a challenge. We need to try and do all of those things. And on a go forward basis, in terms of our planning, we need to make sure that environmental justice is a key component to the decision making that we make in terms of you know, projects and, um, and approaches on policy that we take. On the second issue of light rail, yes, we do have it in Southern California, although it's limited. Oh, and and, and uh, Senator, do you want to talk about light rail? I'm happy Since to it, if you okay. want me to. Okay, I'll pass on light rail so that the Senator can talk about that. Um, and he can talk about the history of it and where he hopes it's going. I hope we are go doing more of it. I'm very supportive of it. Um, I'm very supportive of above grade rail as opposed to a lot of digging and, and, um, and uh, subway, subway, subway uh, because. You right. reverted back to your homegirl roots did. right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, because subway is so much more expensive, you know, per mile. Absolutely. And you just don't get the value. So, but there are places, especially in East LA, where going underground is going to have to be a part, I think, uh, or, or could very well be a part because, again, of housing and density and displacing community. On the third issue of carpool, um, I am a huge fan of carpool in its original iteration, which was the goal being carpool lanes for carpools. We've had some modifications of that in law uh, in recent times. Uh, you may know that as of January, if you drive a hybrid, you can go in the lane anytime. Um, I, I support hybrids, so I supported the bill, but I was cautious and said we need to look at that legislation in three years to see if it is not um, uh, basically overrunning the initial policy, which was about getting people to share a ride. And if the, if the lane gets so crowded that by hybrids, that there's no, it's not, uh, it's not an easier ride, it's just like the rest of the lanes, then we've defeated the purpose of carpools. In terms of the Bay Area and the, and the carpool lanes there and uh, congestion, the senator hit the nail on the head. In terms of defining a, uh, um, you know, what is prime time, what is rush hour, in LA, it's basically um, a very, very long uh, set of hours from like 6 a.m until about 8 p.m. during the work week, and even on Saturday and Sunday. So um, the dynamic is a little different down here. In fact, significantly different um, down here. So, uh, we'll and, then, and then the oh, senator yes. wants to light rail. Oh, just, uh, light rail. Uh, we have the, uh, the gold line out to Pasadena. We, have, we are doing the, the, is it the blue line to, to the east side? Where, it's, uh, um, Oh, they change line. the colors red all the time. Red line. Red. The red line um, co to, to, to the east side, we have the blue line, which goes from downtown to Long Beach, and we are now supposed to break ground on the exposition line, which will go from downtown down to exposition right away. Um, for w w w Transportation people were, are also have this thing about doing big projects. Everybody wants to do some big projects. So that's why we had these subways, and then we had problems with the subways, and then they, they went away. The, the, I have complained about the way our uh, Metropolitan Transportation um, Authority operates, but the one smart thing they did a long time ago was they bought up all of the old railway right-of-ways. So all those neighborhoods that had railroad tracks, uh, and that went through a lot of this town uh, on into the west side, uh, those tracks still exist and sometimes are still used. So they, bought, so they have those, and there is a plan to create a light rail system um, to move throughout the city. Um, she, uh, uh, Assemblywoman Orpez is absolutely right. Um, we tried the subway thing, it didn't work, there are too many complications. It cost oodles and oodles of money either to go down and sometimes to go up, um, but we've created uh, some at-grade um, um, situations where we synchronize with the lights and all that kinds of stuff. So 
that is a very effective way to move people. Ironically, our subway, our light rail system has been slowed down for, by environmental justice groups, but not environmental justice group, but the biggest impediment to doing a light rail now is the bus riders union. Because for a while, we spent billions on these subways with, and let the buses get completely overcrowded, and they were correct. And now that they have won some lawsuits and uh, had some consent decrees and have negotiated with the MTA, that is getting better. But their view of the world is still that if you spend any dollar on something Anything. expensive like light rail, then you are by definition squeezing the, the buses without regard to the fact that the light rail will help the people who are also on these crowded buses um, also. The other problem that we have had in mass transit is we've been chasing this magic commuter. You know, that this, com this middle class, upper middle class is going to get out of their Lexus and all of a sudden start riding well, the light rail or the bus. Lexus, I don't well, know. you know, uh, upper middle class <laughs> folks, where, 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 and, and some, or, some of the women or has been, has been also helpful in this. We need to focus on the people who must ride transit. And if you are transit dependent, meaning that's your main way to get around, and we, if we get all of those people to be happy, the system will, will, will sort of evolutionally get better so that we'll get those magic commuters. But we do this thing where we spend a billion dollars in order to get people to commute from way over here, and then we're surprised when they don't do it. Well, except that I have to say, the great example of success is the first experiment, which was in my town, Long Beach, oh, where we actually used right, the actual red car, old lane, you know, the, the, the rails, we use the same you might have route, to explain to them what the red car is. The red is. car, way long time ago, even before, before I was born. Right, before we I both mean, were born. Well, we can have Dr. Fitzgerald explain it. He was there when they started it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, got the <laughs> you kept the first ribbon? Oh, my God. Anyway, like uh, red, red, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, my goodness. Um, this is a Catholic university. Yes. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> the, uh, the red car was actually, as the senator said, it was rails, but it also was attached ahead. It was electric. Right. And it ran through the entire city or greater LA area. And then it was abandoned because why? Do we know? The car, the car industry, the auto industry, had a stronger lobby than the red car folk. And so they got the politicians to decide that everybody should be in cars instead of on rail in the, in the mass transit. And so they tore them all up, put everybody in cars, and now here we are trying to go back where we came from. We're, Long Beach has a success though, Dr. Garrett, in that um, you know lots of workers in downtown LA mm -hmm. who live all along the blue line take it every day to commute, uh, white collar, blue collar workers, students, you name it. And it's to capacity. It is our most had successful to add line. cars to, to increase capacity. Yeah. We are going to have the head of the bus riders union come and speak to the class uh, later on. Oh, good. Uh, so, Aram. Hi, good evening. My name is Aram. And my question is um, you were talking a lot about uh, the issue of having a lot of youth action and uh, in terms of transportation issues. Do youth serve on the boards that you mentioned, and has there been any push recently to get more student representatives who are at the heart of the effect in a lot of cases to serve on a lot of these transportation boards and such, and, and what can we do in that sense? MTA has public members. I don't, know that there's, I, don't, I, I don't know that there's a youth thing, but there's a couple of young people on, on, on the MTA. Well, I mean, young in, 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 in our count years. You me. Yeah, <laughs> young, young in our years, but... but I was on the board. But, you know, the, and, you know they had kind oh, of a yeah. debate about this on West Wing last night. Um, <laughs> they did, about, you know, lowering the voting age. But the, the, the thing is that what, what tends to be appointed to these people are people who are of voting age and have some expertise. Um, the Bus Riders Union, I think, does have a very active youth um, um, part of it. So yeah. you, 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 you could certainly can do that through them. But I'm, I'm a strong advocate as a former uh, trustee in the CSU when I was a student and a very active student when I was at the university. Uh, I, I, I think that we ought to have uh, user participants. The, the Bus Riders Union, and you can ask them about this when they came, have advocated for a rider member on the board. Uh, and that could be a place where a student would plug in or some other rider. Yeah, I think uh, Mayor Hahn actually appointed a, a rider member oh, early maybe? in his term, and then oh. he fired him. 
Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So, question way back there. Coordination. Coordination. You want to take that? Uh, hit, okay. hit and miss. Hit and miss. Um, they do have in Long Beach with Long Beach Transit, which is not LA MTA run. Uh, they have a coordinated schedule. Uh, MTA. I'm not sure. I don't. I think it's hit and miss. I'm well, the concept. Sure. The concept is for them to have feeder lines into um, the light rail. The problem is. Um, they don't always, depending on where you live and, and when you're going, if there aren't a whole lot of people in your category, it makes it very expensive to have this feeder line. But right. in the most cases along most major thoroughfares, there is a feeder line that, that will take you to some other major artery. I mean, that's the concept. Doesn't always work. Also, if you're not transit dependent but just want the convenience uh, in terms of going into downtown LA, they have actually park and ride stations where you can park either your bike or your car and, uh, and get on the light rail at one of those stations. Um, yeah, Michaela over here, as, as he's bringing the, uh, as he's bringing the uh, microphone, actually it's for the recording, so, but uh, whilst we're waiting for her to ask a question, high-speed rail, what's the, the likelihood of that from you I'm know, San Diego it. to San Francisco, maybe to San uh, I'm actually for it too. I started out not being for it. Well, tell them what high speed rail is. High speed rail is a, uh, a, a rail line that goes from San Diego essentially to San Francisco with an offshoot, with stops in San Jose, with an offshoot to uh, Sacramento uh, that travels above 200 miles an hour um, and would get you essentially there in a couple hours. And so as opposed to going to the airport two hours in advance and checking in and sitting down and going through security and all that stuff, you go to the train station, get on the train and ride there and you get to use your phone and your computer and all that stuff all the way. Um, it's a $30 billion project. And so when it first came to being, I... That's just a couple of months in Iraq. Exactly. Amen. And if we were the federal government, we'd be able to operate like that. Uh, I opposed it because it was one of those things where they, as I talked you about before, is it sounds like a great idea, but we never really thought about whether people would ride it and whether or not they would pay whatever the amount is that you need to pay to sort of make it worth it. So what they did is, which was very smart, they reduced it down to a basic trunk line from, not from San Diego, but from LA to San Francisco, and they said it'll cost us $9 billion to do this part of it. And so we'll do this $9 billion, and then once we got a ridership going on that, we will use the revenue from that to build out the system. Very smart idea. I'm for it. We passed the, uh, we passed the bill to put the bonds on the ballot, and then, of course, we got into a budget crisis. So, uh, yeah, well, it's due to be on the ballot in 06. Right. And there's going to be a push to move it back, I'm gonna, and I'm going to be against that. Okay. I'm going to be forward and putting it on the ballot in 06, but uh, others may have other points of view. We have so many bond issues. You know, in a former life, before I chaired transportation, I had a different point of view on some of this, yeah, too. Yeah, that's true. Because I was the chair of the Assembly Budget Committee for two years. Uh, in the worst years <laughs> of our lives, I got to do that fun job. And what happened? Um, they fired you, or...? Uh, no, I asked to be relieved oh, okay. of that of stressful duty. Um, no, I got, as part of a negotiated agreement when uh, we were, it's a whole other story about a speakership battle and stuff like that. But anyway, I said I wanted to be relieved of budget duty and, and be transportation chair where I could actually have some fun. And here we are with no money in transportation. But, uh, but because of that, my point is, because of wearing those different hats, I do have an understanding of what he's talking about here in terms of the dough. And if we can figure out ways of doing projects in chunks that are more affordable, we can maybe get a little further on some of these projects. Michaela. Okay, I have a couple of questions. One is which, how many of the legislators, legislators um, or of you guys, period, lead by example in terms of using these alternative forms of transportation, using the rails, carpooling, um, so that maybe that would work as an incentive for other people to say, okay, if it works for you guys and you guys are busy, then you know maybe we can incorporate that into our own lives. And also, I wanted to um, ask, are you guys advocating for the extension of the 710? Ah, 
I am 100,000% behind ex extension of the 710, and I have family members who live in South Pasadena who are very unhappy with me because they don't want to be displaced. But it makes good horse sense to finish the project and to get that connector between um, uh, Alhambra and Pasadena uh, done. Now, I don't have a position on what route makes sense. Uh, you know, they're looking at different options. I would like to displace as few historic homes as possible, frankly, and also look at, you know, low-income housing as an also a criterion in terms of evaluating the various options. It's very difficult to do, but I support going forward with the project. And in, on your second, on your first question, do you want to ask that? Or I, I was going to talk about hybrids. Yeah, that you talk now, about that. You want to, okay. Well, we now have a policy in the legislature where we purchase hybrids, and a lot of our members are now using uh, 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 driving hybrids, which I think is a great example because everywhere they go, uh, they are a visible manifestation of you know saving uh, petroleum. And in terms of carpooling. I don't do much carpooling except when I'm out and about with a staff member, and that's just because I'm out running around and I don't have the ability to always bring somebody else with me just because I have a small budget here in the district and not a lot of staff members. I just can't have afford to have one just chauffeur me around all the time. So I don't, on my personal time with my friends, we like to carpool a lot, and so, you know, I mean, because it's faster. On the freeway, so we do that. But so, so when's the last time you took a bus? A bus. Um, for me. Ne ne next question. No, 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 no. It's a good question. I mean, I, I, I do take. I have taken a bus. Probably not in a while. I've been uh, ill for a while, and so. <laughs> I no, but I, I, no, I'm serious. Actually, I'm actually, serious. I think. But see, here's the. Th the I mean, the other thing. The other thing, which this leads to my the, my original point is. We've got to make the transit options fit the lifestyles of the people rather than the opposite way. Yeah. So, you know, well, I that, certainly... That'll never happen then. Our well, lifestyles... Well, well, but no, that's not true. If you're going, for instance, if you're going from, if you're going from home to work and you stay at work all day and then you go home, you can ride some kind of mass transit. Yeah. If you're like Assemblywoman or Paisa and you've got six different places to go on a schedule, um, you, can't, you can't take the bus. You, you can't take transit, and sometimes you've got staff people with you, and sometimes you don't, and you've got to, if you're a salesperson making sales calls, you can't take the bus to every one of those, but if you work in an office and you spend most of the day in that office, you can. We have to, the idea is not to move everybody to mass transit. The idea is to have a bunch of Very different good. alternative interconnected That's options for people. Much better answer than mine. So, we, because you know what, we need highways. No matter how you slice it, you're not going to get enough people on the bus or mass transit in order to relieve our congestion. So we need more highway miles, and we need the mass transit option, and we need you know all sorts of other options. But I actually think the hybrid is a great way to convey a strong message. Okay, let's get Carla and then Luis. Good afternoon. My name is Carla, and I was just wondering if you want to make the mass transit more appealing to upper middle class. How is that possible? Are you going to put the Lexus logo on it or a BMW logo on it so they can I, I think the opposite. part of their class? I think the opposite. I think we have to make it comfortable and, I mean, you know, again, Fernando asked, have you been on a bus? And, you know, one of the reasons that people don't ride buses is because they are not, it's They're not dirty. a comfortable experience. It is not a comfortable, and happy experience. The only people that use mass transit and now are people that are ha that have to, and a very few people who choose for intellectual reasons too. So I think we need to make the people that are transit dependent happy and comfortable, That's and right. then we will de have developed a ridership and a positive ridership that will then attract other people. If Do we bought enough buses to actually meet the need, we'd be doing great. You know, and do you the, do the demand now? And, do, and and the other thing is, we need to make them better. I mean, part of the thing, part of the reason why people don't ride buses, and we had this debate about whether or not to do dedicated bus lanes versus light rail. Part of the problem was people just don't like the word bus, and they don't like getting on this thing <laughs> that's stinky and noisy and, and 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 things like that. So we do 
after we get that ridership going, have to upgrade them. I mean, you will need to make them appeal to people um, um, that, that, that want to be on them. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Well, no, it's not leather seating, but you know what you could do? You could, ha you could have wireless internet access. You could have uh, um, um, screens with the, you know, st stock things on them. And you know what? That's what they're starting to do on commuter trains, you know, where people commute. Uh, it's more in the Bay Area, even, even though we have Metrolink here. But you can upgrade them to appeal to those people. And if you ride the train, like a lot of people ride the train from Connecticut into New York City, there are things you can do. You can make the stations or you more can make comfortable. everybody have a seat instead of have to stand. There's one thing, too. Let's get Luis over here. We have time for maybe one or two more questions, and that's it. Um, Excuse me. I think all these ideas are great. Um, I know that traffic in L.A. is horrible, like everywhere. But the big bulk of it is in the west side. Like, I, the 405 is horrible. Like, I, I work in Santa Monica, and honestly, from LME to Santa Monica in traffic hour is like an hour, you know, sometimes on Lincoln Boulevard, you know, and it's just horrible. And so, so maybe focusing more on the areas that need it the most, like maybe the west side, um, the upper, upper class, because that's where, you know, most of the traffic is at. Because I mean, I, you go through, uh, you go to from Santa Monica to, to downtown, you know, through Beverly Hills. You no traffic there. Not, oh yeah. No <laughs> people. Uh, we'll no traffic. Uh, we'll Although I think I'm going to challenge you, young man, on your really? assumptions. Okay. Uh, I will too. I'll challenge you on your assumptions <laughs> because number one, now, number one is we do know that the 405 is one of the, and there is a section of the 405 that is truly the most congested. Where it meets uh, the five down that's, south, is that what I, I, I can't remember exactly where it is, but there is a piece. I don't know if it's your piece, but it's a piece. But I would challenge you to try to drive the 710 freeway and tell me that it's not congested. Or the five at Rush Or Tower. the five. Or the, our entire, our entire go, Southern California area is in gridlock. You want to be the one to face? You want to be the one to face the people of all those other regions to say we're going to only give money to the upper, the upper class, wealthier people, and they're part of the freeway? No. What, what's that about? No <laughs> kidding. What is that about? What I was saying is like, because most of the people See, he's actually an East L.A. guy, but you put an LMU shirt on him, all of a sudden he's a West Sider. <laughs> What do they call that, a coconut? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Come on, Luis. <laughs> What's that? Let's let him defend himself. Let the man talk. I come from a lower income, not the country. But the thing is, most of the people that work, you know, work in those areas that are in the upper class. No, you know what you responded to? This is, a, in all due respect to you, this is the perfect example of perspective and the problem that we have. Because you, you're not responding to like where you're from or even where you're going, but you're responding that your particular commute have, and, you, and you're from a low income, you know, you say you're a low income guy, that your particular commute is bad. So you think that the 405 is the worst one in the city. And the woman uh, who spoke earlier said the 710 County. was the worst thing in the city. And so everybody, this is the part of our problem is that everybody thinks that whatever their little problem is, has got to be the worst one in the city. And they're all bad. And they're all they bad. They all need to be fixed. They all need to be fixed. You know, the, the 90 freeway is not so bad. And, uh, and I, I'm going to, wait, and Dr. Vera, I just have to say one other little thing about that. We have to be very careful. Somebody asked earlier about environmental justice, and we need to be very careful about the assumptions we make about the poor and the rich and who has the right or who we should serve first and all that stuff because there is a historical bias against poor people that some of us are trying to undo through a little bit of reparation in the other direction. And so we have to be very careful about, about that and making assumptions and whose need is more important, okay? Is it more important for the woman who goes and scrubs the toilets at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown LA to get to her job or is it more important from East LA to downtown? Or is it more important for the, you know, the executive to get to their uh, record company in the valley? Which is more important? I, I would actually know? add to that that the difference. The, the other thing is, I think we're we're on this, you know, 
person of color, white person paradigm, poor person, rich person paradigm. The problem is really not with those. The prob the, the conflict Who's is left. Well, let me tell you. Oh, okay. You got you got to wait for the. Oh, okay. The, the conflict is suburban and urban. That's ah. So right. it's it's about sending you know MetroLink and light rail out to the suburbs right. versus people in the city, whether they're rich or poor. If you looked at when when I first got into transportation. I looked at a map of the MTA's wish list of things that they wanted. And there was a line from w down Wilshire, from the beach to downtown. There was the line down uh, uh, essentially Figueroa or Flower, wherever the blue line goes, all the way to Long Beach. It drew a box around most of South Central Los Angeles, most of Mid City, most of West LA, most of the South Bay. So, and, and while, while there were people trying to get out to the valley and trying to get out to Claremont and trying to get out to Pasadena, so our conflict, particularly on mass transit, is not so much the other things, it's suburban and urban. Yeah, good point. Okay. We have time for one more question. Anybody? Joaquin. Okay. One, one last question. The last one, man, you better make it Amen. good. You better make it good, is right. Or else Jenny's gonna jump on you like she did him. <laughs> I would like to know um, how we can stop, uh, or if we can stop, lobbyists and interest groups who prevent transportation corridors going through your neighborhood, such as the red line that was that was supposed to go to Santa Monica, and you know there there, se there were several people who could, you know, in response to your question, I used to work in a Santa Monica office, and the lady who cleaned the offices at night took a bus from East LA to Santa Monica, and it took her three hours. She is the one that could have taken the red line from there to Santa Monica in probably like 45 minutes. You want to take that? Well, so what can we do about well, Are there special interests and spe you know, uh, Two things you have to know about the red line. The red line was actually stopped by Congressman Waxman, <laughs> um, who did not want them drilling under mid Wilshire because there's methane gas. I mean, he's, an one, he, he's one of the most liberal forward thinking guys. So it wasn't an environmental justice. But I was thinking about this today on the plane down. Everybody's a special interest. And the minute you say the people, the rich people stopped it from going through their neighborhood, then you also prevent the, you know. Less, less rich. N now that there are less rich people who have advocacy groups like the Bus Riders Union and like the various env environmental justice things, now that they finally got up and going, then you all of a sudden say, well, gee, we shouldn't be listening to all these special interests. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. go ahead. That's sort of democracy. I mean, you know, the, the notion that people can... Uh, share their point of view with their elected officials. I think uh, don't just don't listen too much to our governor about that special interest thing. I think a lot of people are, No, I'm very serious about this. There's a buzz term that he's using special interest, which is to, to, to define everything Every group that he doesn't agree with okay is a special interest and I swear to God that's a, I swear to goodness That's the case <laughs> and and frankly you're a special interest, I'm a special interest, he's a special, we all have a right to our interest. So and so I don't object to people, you know. Advocating their advocating position. Our interest. system is set up so that everybody who's got an interest, which by definition, because it's theirs, as opposed to other people's, is a special interest, are supposed to get access to the system. And I think pretty much people do get access to the system. In fact, the examples you talked about is homeowners blocking something, not high-powered high lobbyists, not, you know, uh, 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 um, people who have some great um, access, but just, you answer. know, real I'll, I'll end with this people. question. It's just a yes or no. So when the governor was talking about girly men, was he talking about Kevin? I don't know what the hell he was talking hey, about. Hey, hey. Okay, with that, thank you very much. <laughs>